Listen to Scottish Sovereigns on the land and the home of No Borders Radio. Hi and welcome to the public law right here on No Borders Radio. Tonight is Friday, May 9th, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can find us at nobordersradio.co.uk. Thank you for joining us. Uh, there's an issue tonight with uh, these changing times. So, how are you both? Okay, I am well. How are you? Good. It's been a busy week. Yeah. A lot of stuff going down. Um, we'll just get right into it. From. Yeah. What? We're going to pretty much uh, do uh, attorney surety news worldwide. Um, I just pulled up some just today about some uh, judges and attorneys all over the place are going down. Lawmakers, senators. Right. Judges, That's attorneys. just another brand of attorney. Yeah. Lawyer, attorney. Lawmaker, attorney. Solicitor, attorney. GL, attorney. Corporation, bunch of attorneys. You know, bank, what they call a bank, it's a law firm. Yep. Uh, run by attorneys. Yep. And the, the attorney oath is under uh, 12 U.S.C. subsection 73, which is under the Banking Act, under the Emergency Banking Act, 1933. Thanks to the quote bankruptcy, that Congress declared and at the same instant adjudicated and found that the citizen was there to offset or discharge congressional bankruptcy once again. And this is, of course, in accordance with the Articles of Confederation. Article 12, human being is pledged and charged to discharge congressional bankruptcy. Of course, in 1933, Congress came in as a trustee over its own bankruptcy, which is very, very interesting. And that's why all of the citizens across the globe find themselves in the lower chambers of the exchequer, which is defined as hell in Black's Law Dictionary, and maintained by the, of course, marshal, which everybody knows is a jail or other institutionalized state, such as a hospital or mental unit, various forms of hell, maintained, of course, by none other than the attorney. You have Lucifer guards hell, He's the one that takes money, the fallen angel, for delivering up the human being. Judas, of course, means with law in Anglo-Saxon. And everybody knows who that is. It's where the money is. Whoever's got the money, honey, is who's going to have control of that chessboard. And the exchequer, of course. And since last year, suing Congress and winning based on the fee schedule and adherence to the public law, of course, which is superior to acts of commerce and private acts according to the restrictive principle of sovereign immunity, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which is uh, 28 U.S.C., Chapter 97, and related. And and attorneys don't want to talk about that unless it's to try to sway you over to some other direction. Right. Because corporations, they come in and they say, well, I'm the United States of America and I'm going to sue this corporation because it's a foreign state. Well, no. A foreign state is defined as a corporation. A foreign state is defined as a business entity facilitating business. And, of course, a confederacy is defined in Black's Law Dictionary as a criminal enterprise. Quite interesting. And of course, the very last line says, what else? See federal government. Now tonight on, let's see, today a lot of things happened today. On wave.com, wayne.com, W-A-N-E. Yeah, I believe it's out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Oh, it's pretty. Attorney arrested on charges of intimidation. Fort Wayne, Indiana, police say a Fort Wayne attorney admitted to writing a post that read, quote, 
I'm going to anal rape you so hard your teeth come loose, end quote, on a Facebook account of oh, a client's those attorneys are ex, vicious. Of a client's ex-husband. Ah, look at this. Come on, he's already being sodomized by a legal process. What more can be done upon humankind by the attorneys other than that actual forcible physical rape and threats by these nasty, nasty, inhuman attorneys, psychopaths? Quote, uh, and I'll continue reading. A warrant was issued on April 28th for James Allen Hansen. According to court documents, Chad Vice contract, contacted an investigator with the Allen County Prosecutor's Office regarding what he perceived to be threats he had received from Hansen, who represents Vice's ex-wife, Nicole Mevis, who had been arrested on a domestic battery charge. Wow, so this attorney is threatening him to get his client more favorable treatment or something? Vice told the investigator who had been involved in Mevis' domestic battery case that Hansen had called him and posted a threatening Facebook message Hansen represented Mel Mevis in both the domestic battery case and the divorce from Vice. Shortly after Vice, Vice contacted the investigator, Chief, De Chief Deputy Prosecutor Mike Mer Alexander and another employee with the prosecutor's office spoke with Hansen at the Allen County Courthouse. During their conversation, Hansen admitted to writing the Facebook post and used an expletive to describe Vice. Isn't that interesting? I mean, this happens every day and prior to this this was just business as usual right yeah i'm an attorney you can't touch me right and they threaten the mail with jail time and threaten the mail with contempt of court if they don't get what they want if they don't hand over in the action of feminism everything to the female what has changed both because this is absolutely contrary to the use of feminism against the male this is contrary to what was known as former policy. Do you have any idea why they're being held accountable now? This is interesting. Well, last year, if you've been following the case, we evidenced what is going on in these kangaroo courts uh, by letting them do what they do. And the, uh, you know, the feminism policy that the IMF has been giving funding to these municipalities for uh that was taken away wah, wah, wah. not only that but uh thanks to the greed entry then of course the uh fictions and includes attorneys corporations judges and the likes they were thrown into the holding corporation instead of the human being. We had been in there since 1929 Geneva Convention. Oh, but the horror babble, the, the female protected under feminism, was so prolific. She was so beneficial to these attorneys, and now the attorneys are going to jail because of it. Do you think this is relative to uh, Revelation there's 18? A, well, now there's that. There's also the old saying, what goes around comes around, and... Now it's time for some coming around and for some accountability. Isn't that what it says? Well, um, wow. On this site, it's called IndianaLawyer.com, which was interesting. Lawyer is a nice word for an attorney. Now, when you hear somebody referring to someone as a lawyer, that's a nice term because. It doesn't tell you what they are. Attorneys, uh, the, the word attorney comes from the word a turn, which means to turn over to another landlord. In other words, to take you out of your state of being and throw you in the chute to be on the hook for congressional bankruptcy. Well, it looks like they're all going into the chute. Um... <laughs> From this IndianaLawyer.com, Justice is suspend attorney who staged own shooting. The Indiana Supreme Court has suspended this Southern Indiana attorney who pleaded guilty last year to a misdemeanor charge stemming from shooting himself in a state park. 
Peter Raventos, who practiced in Spencer, has been suspended for failure to cooperate with the Disciplinary Commission per an April 29th order. Raventos, Raventos was already suspended for continuing legal education non-compliance and dues non-payment. Now this one is absolutely interesting because as fallout from the agreed entry and of course the genocide order um, in January the news reported that the attorneys <coughs> are going to be required now as part of their continuing education to undergo psychological evaluation and at that time 7,000 attorneys were already shuffled off into <laughs> the psychiatric industry to be maintained as product according to the genocide order itself and these days are very very interesting so as part of the coercion it looks like they're 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 um, holding them in contempt for not continuing their education which is very very profound to see so sorry mr. and mrs. attorney surety product um, it looks like you're not even going to get out of this one anytime soon and and um, sadly you wanted to play the game you know I watched for years and years and years and years as you cannibalize human beings consume them in your legal practice in your court procedure as according to policy and it looks like the shoes on the other foot so Good luck with that, and uh, you know, just take it like a man, as I've heard so very often in these court orders. Darn the luck, we just couldn't do it. Sorry, I tried my best. How many times have you spoke those words as you sodomized, mentally sodomized, and these families over and over and over again outside of humanity and uh, this is interesting from the Nairobi news dot nation dot co dot ke top judge spends the night in police cells this one's very interesting a top judge spent Friday night in police cells after he was arrested on suspicion of driving under the influence along Nagang Road Court of Appeal Judge Tenkel Ole Kante was driving his official GK vehicle at the time of his arrest. He was booked in at the Mutheja police station under a current book OB number, I, I don't know what that character is, 35 uh, 2014. It looks like a 4, but it's missing part of it. So it's a current book number, that's just a booking number, is all though. Yeah. It's just, it's just uh, so, and it, you know, and as a recap, then judges are in reality, as we evidence in my case, are just attorneys wearing black dresses, pretty black dresses. Okay, because they don't do uh, their their job uh, according to judicial canon. They're only supposed to rule on the evidence, as we evidence directly in my case. They represent absolutely and of course we're representing a whole bunch of sureties now as the attorney goes down and all of these females are actually being held accountable accountability outside of feminism and the specialty that used to be there oh boy it looks like the bottom fell out of everything on the countin2.com Cross teacher arrested, charged with sexual battery of a student across South Carolina. We have new information about the former Cross High School teacher accused of having sex with three of her students. Ellen Namick, 29, faced a bond court judge Thursday evening. As she entered the courtroom, family members of the three victims, two 17-year-old brothers and one 18-year-old, all high Cross High School seniors, were in court. According to affidavits on ne April 11th, Namek had sexual relations with each of the victims. Ugh, that's just creepy. However, the attorney for the victims, Mike Bosnick, says there were multiple acts and locations. 
quote, it started off with kind of a sexual talk, and it ended up dirty talk, and then it ended up texting pictures, and it's under our understanding that this teacher had would have had sexual talks with her class on numerous occasions, and it escalated from that into, you know, actual physical, the physical, physical part of this, end quote. Bosnak said he believes the sexual acts took part just off of the school campus, but at school as well. Nymek is married with three young children. I asked her attorney David Ayler if his client did what she is accused of. Quote, if she did that, I'm not aware of it. Like I said, I don't know all the information on it, and it's not a situation where we sat down, you know, it's early on in this process. End quote. He said they expect to learn more about it in the near future. For the three charges of sexual battery with a student, the judge gave Namek a surety bond or of just under $22,000. She was ordered on house arrest once she gets out, gets out. She can have no access or contact with current students at Cross High School, and she's not allowed to visit the Cross community. She is also not allowed to post anything about the case online. Nymek resigned her position with the school district. She turned herself into authorities early Thursday. If convicted, she faces up to five years in prison for the two charges related to the 17-year-old and up to 30 days for the charge related to the 18-year-old student. The Berkeley County Sheriff's Office has been investigating this case since receiving a complaint on April 28, 2014, in reference to the sexually, sexual battery of a student. Sick, 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 sick. However, she didn't get away with it this time. You know, I years ago... You know, there was a 12-year-old that was raped by a female teacher, and she ended up pregnant, and later on, even though he was victimized by her, he got to pay child support, and it was the same thing with uh, Mary Kay Letourneau. Mary Kay spent a little bit of time in prison for twice raping uh, Vili Falau, and eventually the... Pierce County prosecuting attorney motioned to dismiss or, or remove quash the restraining order that allowed Latorno to not only marry her victim later, but she also has access to two minor children at that time, which are males. She's a predator. But now, as you can see, they're no longer getting away with these things. Yeah, well, it's time, huh? It's, it is. Uh been gone on long enough nobody seems to know why or who exactly their catchphrases are things like the bankers oligarchs uh, the Knights of Templar Knights of Malta and yeah you know certainly these things play in as our arms and agency of Congress but the the, the thing you have to wrap your mind around here is Congress was given world dominion under the Atlantic Charter uh, 1941. Okay, this is why we're seeing things on a global scale happen simultaneously. And due to that being their chosen form of government now, okay, now they're going to be held accountable in the same fashion we've always been held accountable as uh, the surety on congressional bankruptcy. Now Congress is run basically it's built on the foundation of the House of Delegates. Okay? This is the lower chambers of the House of Representatives. Right, right, right. And your, and your foundation for your house is always the bottom, the basement. And what is, what's in the basement? It's the uh, House of Delegates, which are all attorneys. And they have full-on administrative control over the American Bar Association, which of course is everything. Association of Corporate Counsel. Board of Governors. All the Congress and Senator members have a staff of usually consisting of three or four attorneys wrapping around them right. now and you're seeing those fall too chief of staff is the head attorney for these guys and and we're watching the chiefs of staff uh, go down as well which is very interesting to see very very interesting to see now when you get elected into an office you're required to give up that bar card if you're an attorney Okay, 
that doesn't change your status as far as what government you are under oath to, which in the case of the attorney, they have an oath to that bar, British Accreditation Registry. And what that is is a credit reporting system. So it's part of massive technology. It just weighs and measures, figures out your denomination, and what force to employ against you in order to make you uh, go a certain direction. X amount of force means you're going to go here. This amount of force means you're going to go there. And it's always been a predetermined outcome until now. Now, once you divest yourself of all that possesses you and drop all of those names and titles, and get rid of that little constitution that's filling you up with all of these concepts, then you're not predictable in your behavior. You're no longer predictable according to the system, and that's when the law merchant wails. Now, it's absolutely profound to actually witness this as it's revealed as according to Revelation 18. Now this one you sent me earlier on Blackfeet Judge issues arrest warrant for Senator Lewis and Clark County today. That, a creepy picture of that guy, isn't it? Yeah, he's pretty creepy. I'll tell you what, if anybody wants to see it, it's NBC. It looks like Peter Laurie and his character is, uh, what was that, Frankenstein's assistant or something? Yeah, it does. It looks like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Hunched yes, over. master. Yeah. NBCMontana.com Helena Montana, a Blackfeet judge, has issued an arrest warrant for a state senator and tribal leader for not paying his fine for a drunken and reckless driving conviction. Senator Shannon Aguar says the May 2nd warrant issued by Judge Marshalline last... It, it must be year, is politically motivated. Aguar says in a Tuesday letter to Last Star, he paid the $200 fine in December but was submitting another $400 to remove his name from the warrant list. Tribal attorney Don Running Wolf says Aguar must appear in court for arraignment. She says there is no record he complied with an October order to buy $200 worth of toys for a Christmas drive. Aguar said Thursday the warrant is driven by an ongoing political dispute among tribal council members that has repeatedly stymied government operations. In simple terms, political cannibalism. This is what happens in Revelation, by the way, in case this surprises any other uh, minion. This is what political cannibalism looks like. Yes, it's politically motivated. Yes, it hurts. How are you going to get out of that? Well, you're not going to. This is what happens when you get caught human trafficking and perpetrating the most heinous crimes, including genocide upon humanity. Now, the attorneys are absolutely terrorizing law enforcement at this time. Yes. And there's a story from WITN.com. Sheriff's son charged with stealing gasoline from county pump. The son of a sheriff is accused of stealing gasoline from the county. Billy Sawyer III has been charged with misdemeanor larceny. Pamaco County Sheriff Billy Sawyer says his 18-year-old son was arrested after he allegedly used his father's gas key Friday at the county pump and put three gallons in his pickup truck. The sheriff says his son's vehicle was low on gas and he put enough in his tank to make it to a convenience store. After being alerted to it, Sawyer says he went to the district attorney who decided the son should be charged with misdemeanor larceny. So he was making things right. He was going to pay for this. Afterward, the 18-year-old offered to reimburse the county 10 times what was taken. The sheriff says in the past he has caught at least four people filling up personal vehicles at the county pump and none of them were ever charged. Sawyer says in those cases the county decided not to press charges. County manager Tim Buck says county employees each have, a, have an assigned key to the pumps. He says while there is a camera at the jail that can pick up activity, they are looking at making improvements to curb any more thefts. Boxes. That includes instituting a card system for employees in, this, in the future. The younger Sawyer has a June 27th court date. Now, of course, the other 
beings were probably attorney friends and relatives and everything else related to this thing but the, the sheriffs to all law enforcement you need to realize that this is just absolute over-the-top intimidation harassment terrorism to get you to align with that policy to align with the attorneys so that you're subjugated and you don't rise up against them as we've seen over and over again that uh, Oh, that FBI agent sheriff down in down south that um, he had pretended to arrest a judge and then he was sued for five million dollars. You know that kind of thing is is intended to put fear into law enforcement so that they don't arrest judges. That's it. Uh, yeah, event. it was Sheriff uh, Payton, I believe his or name was. Payment, something like that. When I went to his website that's offered in Facebook, it says that he's FBI. He was always a detective. He was never a sheriff. He only pretended to be a sheriff at the very end there. So make sure you do your homework, do your own research, and find out where these actors are stemming from before you believe anything that happens in this media presentation under the House of Representatives, which is only a marquee. It's a large tent that puts on many, many, many acts. Okay, I got one... Um this is just from today. Judge pleads guilty to DWI. An Albany State Supreme Court justice arrested on the Northway after he drove radically and refused to take an alcohol breath test. Pleaded guilty Tuesday to a misdemeanor count of drunken driving. Carl Landesino, 47, Yorktown Heights. Pleaded guilty to a single count during a an appearance before Albany County Judge Stephen Herrick, according to Albany County District Attorney David Soares. Then Decino, a former attorney for the Kings County Democratic Party, was arrested October 17th after state troopers said they noticed him driving erratically on the Northway. Landesino told troopers he was on his way home from a judicial conference when he was pulled over. State police said he showed signs of intoxication but refused an alcohol breath test. He was charged with a misdemeanor DWI and ticketed for traffic infractions. Now, if that was a, your, your normal citizen, uh, the, the, the police would have just you know, probably uh, beat him to a pulp for refusing their orders. Uh, you know, or beat him to death, maybe, if we see so much of that going on. And um, that's from the attorney's policies they give these cops. Anyways, uh, finishing this up, after his guilty plea, Landesino was sentenced to a one-year condition discharge that requires him to complete a substance abuse program. He was also ordered to pay a $500 fine and have an ignition lock device installed in his vehicle. He is also required to attend the victim impact panel in a drinking driver program. His license was suspended for six months. Aww, poor judgey there. He entered right into the psychological industry, didn't he? Yeah, judgey Pooh got uh, his due. Absolutely, and it, it doesn't end there. You know, the, the premise of the... Um, <clears throat> conditional sentencing, home arrest, probation, parole, those things are intended to allow for the victim or who's in the shoot to violate that, which is a, a greater sentence than originally, you know, and that's, that's the name of the game. Poor little attorney surety there. Um, WarwickOnline.com, Cranston, West Warwick, businessman charged in bath salts probe. A local businessman and former youth sports coach has been charged in federal court with selling synthetic drugs known as bath salts, authorities announced on Thursday. Glenn Leonardo, 48, of Cranston, who owns Buddha's Bazaar Shop, Smoke Shop in Cranston, and Excitement Video on Smoke Shop in West Warwick, was arrested Thursday following a year-long investigation, according to the Office of U.S. Attorney Peter F. Naranja. He was released on $10,000 unsecured bond following an appearance in U.S. District Court. Now, this is very interesting because these entities 
were originally created as CIA presentations, and those are the main informants against people um, that uh, are the narcs for, you know, when people are going and buying bongs, and when they're buying pipes, and when they're buying papers, rolling papers, and things like that. These are the folks that list to the law enforcement what you're purchasing. If you're purchasing grow lights or whatever else. Now this is neat to see that the CIA is now being taken down. And we saw more of that um, earlier this week with the gun dealer. They, they were talking about the arms dealing and everything else that the CIA has been promoting and has a stockpile down in Texas and everything else. So these agents are being held accountable as well. For all those that deliver Jesus up, you know the routine. <laughs> Everybody, every Judas commits political suicide. You know, there's we've spoken so much about the Senate and what their um, actual actions are, what they do upon humanity. And finally, we're seeing a lot of accountability from the znews.india.com. Nepal lawmaker arrested over deadly blast, says police. In Kathmandu, Nepalese police have arrested a lawmaker for allegedly mastermind, masterminding a bomb attack that killed four people and injured dozens of others in 2012 an officer told AFP on Monday. Sanjay Kumar Sa, a former government minister, was arrested late Saturday over the attack targeting 150 protesters rallying in the southern city of Jan Janakpur, 20 kilometers from the Indian border. Police accused Sa of holding a personal grudge against one of the protest leaders who escaped unharmed when the bomb strapped to a motorbike exploded in April of 2012, killing four and injuring th nearly 30 others. Quote, we have strong evidence that Sa planned the attack, end quote, District Police Official Utam Subade said. A trial against Sa from the regional Chabahawana party is underway following his arrest in the border town of Burjong for allegedly plotting the attack. Police say Sa, a minister from 2009 to 2010, had a grudge against the protest leader after comp competing with him for lucrative real estate contracts. Both men are accused of using armed gangs to secure development projects. That's what they do. That's what the law enforcement has been since 1933, the bankruptcy of the United States Incorporated. Those corporate policy enforcers, armed to the teeth, has been a gang working on behalf of corporations, maintaining development. And now, they're being held accountable for their works and actions, which is amazing, absolutely amazing to see. These things aren't going away, folks. Senate, House of Representatives, agents... You're all going down, and as I've stated over and over again, give me back all the children, and I stop going after your throat like a pit bull. Because until then, we're going to keep on keeping on, and you're going to see more and more of you and your peers falling down. And the best that you can hope for is that you roll on them before they roll on you. Now... All of this, commerce and navigation, is a means and mechanism of human trafficking. And today, on Newsday.co.zw, Zim Border Post Conduits for Human Trafficking. Some passengers position themselves at the otherwise sleep compatible back seat but suffer a backlash from the conductor who denies them the chance for unclear reasons. As the clock ticks towards the 10th hour, the bus finally takes off. Somewhere along the way, the bus pulls off the road when a crew member sprints to a thicket, returning with a shabbily dressed man who boards the bus and files straight to the back seats. And just before reaching the border post, the six men disembark with their two keepers and dash into the darkness. Stories about human trafficking often appear to be fictitious Western-style movie material set in faraway places like cities in Mexico, 
Argentina, Pakistan, small towns and countries across the seas like Vietnam or rural parts of Cuba, but in reality it happens in cities, towns, and villages all over the world. Zimbabwe is apparently deeply involved in the criminal activity. Now, what this is showing you folks is your own governments trafficking human beings through a network called Commerce and Navigation. I urge everybody to read these articles as they come out so you're more realizant of what's been going on and what has been stopped thanks to the United States and lowercase and our suit against Congress, against the United States of America, against the United States Incorporated, against the United Nations against each and every one of these corporations trafficking human beings for profit and leading to the demise of the human race and there will be no more and each and every one will be held accountable according their according to their works and that means whatever you've done you're gonna have a visited back on you tenfold exactly as it's written Of course, there's no mention of that in the recent, uh, oh goodness, what was it? It was the, uh, well, let me get my head wrapped around it here. I'm going off my memory, but uh, yeah, do you know what story I'm talking about? Uh, gosh, we've gone through so many here in the last three days. It's been like overwhelming. Um, which one? I mean, there's so many of the judges and senators and attorneys being held accountable, and um, it's just it's it's so it, it's overwhelming for us here to even keep up with what's going on, as well as the overwhelming aspect of you know, oh my gosh, this is really happening. Well, okay, I'll come back to that here, but uh, did you hear about the one in San Salvador, El Salvador? No. Uh, judge uh, in El Salvador on Tuesday issued an arrest uh, order for former President Francisco Flores, who faces charges of embezzlement, illegal enrichment, and disobedience. Jar judge Marta Rosales asked Interpol for help in arresting Flores who Salvadorian authorities believe has left the Central American country and could be in Panama. Panama's immigration agency said it has no record of Flores entering the country. So apparently I don't know where he's at, but Flores 53 was charged last week with embezzling 5.3 million while he was uh, president from 1999 to 2004. He was also charged with mis managing $10 million that was donated a decade ago by Taiwan, Taiwan's government during his presidency. Further charge of disobedience accuses Flores of failing to show for a meeting with Congressional Commission investigating what happened to the money Taiwan donated. Flores has said he received the money personally from Taiwan and handed it over to the intended state projects, he has offered no proof, though, of the handover. Yeah, he forgot where he put the receipts. You know how it is. These uh, corporate attorneys, you know how it is. They're just losing stuff all over. He knows he did it, but, you know, there's no evidence of it. Salvadoran officials have said the investigation began after prosecutors received information last year about suspicious operations detected by the U.S. Treasury Department. Flores is a member of the Conservative Nationalist Republican Alliance, which held the Salvadorian presidency for 20 years until President Mauricio Funes of the leftist Farabuno Marti National Liberation Front was elected in 2009. Yeah. So they're going after all these guys from the past. Oh okay? yeah. I mean, the ones that aren't in office right now, they're they're a little easier pickings than the ones that are in office. 
Well, they want to start there first because that's where the wealth is. So they have all these retirement accounts and all these assets that need to be redistributed to discharge their current bankruptcy, which their current bankruptcy is to the United States, lowercase. And it, they're really hard pressed now on, on being able or with ability to pay that back because of the amounts that they owe humanity itself. And um, sadly, you know, this is how it's going to be paid back. And whatever floats their boat. You know, we warned them. We gave them the opportunity to step away, and, and uh, they did not. And now we're watching, I mean, just absolute um, chaos amongst themselves and, and rolling on each other. And, and um, from RFE rl.org court releases former Azerbaijani lawmaker jailed for extortion now this one is very very interesting a court of appeals in Baku has released former Azerbaijani lawmaker Gular Amadova who was sentenced to three years in jail for extortion via fraud and obstruction of justice the court replaced Amadova's three-year incarceration sentence with a suspended sentence on May 5th. She left the courtroom a free woman. Hello, any of the peers of Amadova. That means that she rolled on somebody and turned states. It's very turned interesting. Turned state evidence on him, huh? Yeah, okay, it's good. very interesting. Because uh, Amadova was arrested in February 2013 after a video circulated on the internet in September 2012 showing her demanding a $1.3 million bribe from an academician to secure a seat in parliament for him. The video caused a public uproar. Amadova said the video was edited to frame her. She was later sentenced to three years in prison. Amadova refused to comment to journalists about a release on May 5th, but she was released, not actually freed, and um, it looks like she's rolled on somebody else, so everybody needs to keep abreast of this current politics because it's, it's very interesting. Out of the watchdog.org, state lawmaker out of jail six days after DUI sentencing. State rep Naomi Gonzalez Democrat El Paso was released from Travis County Jail at 5.19 a.m. Thursday, less than six days after she was sentenced to 15 days in jail for driving while intoxicated. Roger Wade, a spokesman for the Travis County Sheriff's Office, said that under state law, any day in custody without a rules violation is rewarded with another day of credit towards time served, unless the judge ordered us otherwise. Quote, in this case, she was given one day credit from the day she was arrested and she was given good time credit, end quote, he said. Any portion of the calendar day spent behind bars, such as the night of her arrest, the afternoon she started her sentence, and Thursday morning counts as a full day, or two, actually. I love that fuzzy math. That must be from Bush. In the early morning... They came out with a new math, yeah, when uh, the trade towers uh, in New York went down. Yep, fuzzy math. In the early morning of March 14, 2013, Gonzalez was arrested after her BMW rear-ended another vehicle, which in turn struck a bicyclist who had to be taken to the hospital. Gonzalez's blood alcohol level was more than twice the legal limit of 0 .08. The police report might as well have been her political epitaph as officers wrote, quote, never once did Miss Gonzalez ask how the other people involved in the crash were doing, but she cried about how she had worked so hard to get where she was, end quote. Of course, she's a psychopath. This is the same psychopath we speak of day in and day out, getting six days for harm upon a human being because of good time and fuzzy math. No course that means that she has more dirt on the higher ups than they have against her now they sent her a warning shot by this arrest and she's knocked back into her placement however again everybody will be held accountable according to their works now that would nexus in fairly well you want to talk about rob ford oh yeah that was funny today um 
Let's see. We had that. Uh, you go ahead and read one, and I'll load this up because it'll take me a minute to uh, find that. Well, story. I can pull. Up, I can pull up the story. Of course, uh, I've got it here on Mail Online, actually. Uh, and uh, let's see here. Uh, they've asked out the uh, profanity, but let's see. Uh, let's see. This one reads. Of course, now he was just turned away from Chicago and sent you know back to Canada they wouldn't let him enter the country and they wouldn't say why because he wanted to come to rehab in the United States and so apparently he's somewhere in rehab in Canada uh, we haven't heard where I haven't said yet but uh, let's see here from the mail online no one better F with me, I'm going to kick you in the F ostrich head. New video emerges of drunk Rob Ford incoherently rambling in a bar. So this is a new video now come out just after he's uh, gone to uh, rehab. Um, his brother came on and his brother is another politician in that same circle. Right. And what this is, is they've been posturing this thing for a very long time. The video evidence of him smoking crack and everything was part of that posture. Um, he took a plea well before anything happened. Now, what we found in recent news, uh, this is within the last two days on May 7th from the citynews.ca. Pre-trial date set for Lisi on drug and extortion charges. Toronto Mayor Rob Ford's friend and former part-time driver, Sandra Lisi, was back in court on Wednesday on two separate cases resulting in drug and extortion charges. He will appear in court on May 13th for a joint pretrial with his co-accused, Jam Shid Barami. Barami is charged with possession of cocaine, three counts of trafficking marijuana, and conspiracy to commit an indictable offense. Lisi is out on bail after being arrested and charged in October with four drug offenses, including trafficking marijuana. The drug charges are in connection with Project Bla Brazen 2, a Toronto police investigation into reports of a video allegedly showing the mayor, mayor smoking crack cocaine. Now the mayor, he's in rehab. The mayor never got charged. The mayor set this all up to take out people who knew secrets which is political cannibalism I'll continue reading on October 31st Lisi was charged with extortion in relation to the so-called crack video Lisi is accused of threatening two men while trying to obtain the video since he's been charged Lisi has been spotted with the mayor at the state Queen restaurant where Ford was filmed ranting in a Jamaican accent in January. The Toronto Star also claims Ford assaulted Lisi earlier in May when the mayor was allegedly filmed smoking from a copper pipe at the home of his sister Kathy Ford. All of this is a presentation. Rob Ford, he's up there dancing around and he thinks he's doing a good job keeping himself out of the, you know, crap hole here. However, he's doing a really good job presenting that he's a nutball in need of psychiatric services, which is worse than anything for all of those interested potential fall guys. Um, it's actually better to uh, be beaten than it is to enter into the psychological industry if you look at history, Nazi Germany being one of them. And um, it's, it's very interesting to see what they're leading this mayor Ford into and and um, you know yeah it's kind of too bad because now his uh, story and his uh, allegations are going to have as much credibility right absolutely not and that's the reason for this posture is um, you know he may have had some dirt on other politicians and other big wigs and elites that all goes away when they paint him as a nutball and he plays a part you know, here he is up there dancing around in a Jamaican accent. Remember the one you were reporting on during the fall into the winter, um, 2013. You know, he's he's been playing the part very well, 
as to his mental capacity and, and according to his works and actions he's not mentally sound which allows them whatever he wants to bring up against his peers and trying to take them out um, it's never going to fly because he's already painted himself as a nutball a raving lunatic well yeah so it is kind of uh, sad to look at from whatever, from whatever angle you're looking at it but there's going to be others out there, so... <laughs> oh, yeah. Lots of fodder. It's the marriage feast. Revelation 19. Num, 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 num. Keep feasting. This is what it looks like. From the WBTW.com, Florence attorney sentenced to five years must pay $2.7 million in mail fraud case. <coughs> and this is... Excuse me. This is out of Florence, South Carolina. United States Attorney Bill Nettles stated today that William J. Rivers III, age 48, of Darlington, South Carolina, was sentenced in federal court in Florence by Chief United States District Judge Terry L. Wooten to 60 months in order to pay $2,702,060 FRNs in restitution for violations of mail fraud, a violation of Title 18, United States Code, Section 134. One. Does that sound familiar? He was charged with mail fraud in violation of Title 18, United States Code, Section 1341. Yeah, well, it's the same way they took Al Capone down. Right. However, what happened last year in the Kurt Martin versus as the United States versus the United States Incorporated, what originally started to occur was the attorney was trying to post you. Yeah, of course, that's how it all started. You know, he said, well, I'm going to, you know, you you haven't statutorily changed your name legally. I'll call you whatever I want to, said the sea wart. Right, which would have, if you would have played into that. And I divested from the, uh, as for the... Uh, uh, Treaty of uh, Amity County and Navigation from 1794, uh, Article 2. Absolutely. And now this is just absolute evidence of what has occurred because 1341 is any fiction attempting to collect debts or anything else through the use of mail. Now that, that includes any attorney of any and all advertisers um, attempting to address a fiction attempting any of these things under acts of commerce and private acts. I'll continue reading. Evidence presented at the change of plea hearing established that clients of uh, Squirrel Knight and Rivers PA, a personal injury law firm in Florence, South Carolina, complained to the South Carolina Bar Association that they had been defrauded by William J. Rivers III and his partner John L. Squirrel Knight during the resulting investigation by the Disciplinary Council of the South Carolina Supreme Court. An investigator scheduled an appointment with John L. Squirrel Knight. However, on the day of the meeting with Squirrel Knight, he committed suicide. Oh, he left the other guy holding the bag. Investigator, investigation revealed that between October 2006 and November 2012, more than 100 clients of the firm were defrauded by more than 3 million dollars 26 of the victims were directly attributed attributable to actions by Rivers. Rivers defrauded his clients by forging their names on releases to settle personal injury cases and lying to his clients, telling them the cases had not been settled. The money was then kept by the law firm in addition to keeping the settlement monies of his clients. Rivers also failed to pay medical providers with the settlement proceeds, leaving the clients owing hundreds of thousands of dollars for the medical treatment they had received. The case was investigated by agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Assistant United States Attorney William E. Day II of the Columbia office handled the case. These are interesting days. The case against the United States Incorporated, United States of America, they threw in that ringer, Andrew Seward. Uh, corporate counsel attorney sitting on the board of governors. Well, he threw himself in. He was, first, he was representing uh, City Bank or City Mortgage, uh, and then you know we went in uh, to uh, 
United States District Court with the thing, removing it from the uh, state court, okay, we should have stopped the eviction. Of course, uh, they went right ahead with that, anyways, because they're just they're just thugs. And uh, but uh, the point of the matter is, and here comes Andrew P. C. Word again, and says, "No, I'm no, I'm representing uh, the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac." Yeah, it was so funny because he came in and he says, "I got a special, important big boy pants on." And uh, ultimately, he's the one that threw it all for the federal government. He's the one that put his hand in there and evidenced exactly what the federal government does using its agents, which was about the most profound thing we've ever seen because I expected to come up against, you know, a game theorist, somebody who had a brain, and, and there was none there. He's just absolutely brainless. Yeah, he basically went uh, over his superiors on that one and said, well, I'm going to handle this because I got big boy pants. Right. It was so funny because it was all like a, a peeing contest, you know, and sadly he lost. From the HeraldTribune.com, three coastal bankers guilty. Panama City, a federal jury in Panama City, Convicted three bankers highlighted in the Herald Tribune's Breaking the Banks investigative series, finding them guilty of defrauding a federally insured loan program out of nearly $4 million. All three were top executives at Coastal Community Bank, which was shuttered by regulators in July of 2010. Terry Dubose was the bank's chief executive, Frank, ba Frank Baker was the bank's attorney and second largest shareholder, and Elwood Woody West served as chief financial officer. They were each indicted last summer on 12 counts of conspiring to commit wire fraud, making false statements, and filing false claims against the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. But just in case all the attorneys out there are not getting this, this is what you do each and every time you file a complaint fraudulently and claim injury and claim that you're protecting human beings, and this is what happens. And I'll continue reading. Now convicted, they face as long as 30 years each in federal prison. The former bankers are expected to be sentenced in July. Just as a heads up for all the attorneys out there that... Now these bankers, quote unquote bankers, they're, were they actually uh, attorneys? Yeah. Okay. The CFO, one, admitted that it's an attorney. Frank Baker was the bank's attorney and second largest shareholder. Uh, one was Terry DeBose with the chief... Bank's chief executive, the West served as chief financial officer, CFO. I mean, I realize a lot of them are, not all of them are, however, these law, uh, well, these banks uh, are run by a board of attorneys, and, and there's really, you know, what you commonly think of a bank as a bank is actually a law firm. Right. That's 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 the one shortcoming of virtually every alternative media outlet out there talking about quote unquote bankers and quote unquote oligarchs. Is who are the bankers? Well, they're attorneys. Attorneys, and they're uh, uh, the, yeah, they're actual law firms. Now the real banker is that judge with his oath under twenty eight. USC 453 to offset congressional bankruptcy using the citizen as a special deposit, which is actually the heart of our case because it's human trafficking. Absolutely, and all of this evidence is written. The attorney oath is 12 USC subsection 73, which is under the Banking Act. And, um, you know, I've got to give a shout out to Michelle. Um, on my Facebook wall uh, a few minutes ago as I was speaking about the attorney arrested on charges of intimidation um, I had posted it on Facebook and Michelle says look at his face ha 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 which way did he go George they certainly are wigging the F out and that is like I love that statement and I love you Michelle <laughs> Yeah, it's all getting to be like a cartoon land, like Obama up there now. He's, uh, you know, like the State of the Union was, uh, it could have been Bugs Bunny up there. I'm dying! Oh! I'm dying! Don't! 
That's what it all is. And it says that in Revelation. It just ends like that. Oh my God, they're dying forever, holding their throats, wailing, moaning. And um, <clears throat> these these days are just absolutely profound. These th This time I would not choose to be anywhere else. From the bostonglobe.com, power patronage are put on trial. Probation officials described in court. To prosecutors, he was power-hungry bureaucrat who bribed legislators with jobs for their friends and family so that he could build his own political empire as head of the probation department. Looks like another fall guy. John J. O'Brien's lawyer called him a hard worker, a public servant who simply played the game of patronage, patronage that typifies politics on Beacon Hill. For 90 minutes Thursday, prosecutors and lawyers for O'Brien, the former probation commissioner, and his top two deputies laid out for a newly sworn in jury of 16 of their peers widely contrasting views of a case that has gripped the political establishment in Massachusetts. Quote, this case is about jobs, end quote, it said Assistant U.S. Attorney Fred M. Wyshak Jr., the head of, this, of his office's public corruption unit, Everyone needs jobs. It's a very powerful thing, that ability to give someone a job. Jack O'Brien handed out those jobs like lollipops to members of the state legislature. End quote. Stelio Sinis, O'Brien's lawyer, told jurors to ignore Wyshik's use of the words rigged and scheme and to see the case for what it is, political patronage, not a crime and nothing more. Quote, Jack ran a law enforcement agency and he ran it well and they don't alleged that he didn't, end quote, Sinis said. U.S. District Court Judge William G. Young told jurors to suspend any judgment until the case ends, predicting that it could last two months. O'Brien, who ran the probation department from 98 until he resigned in 2010, and his deputies, Elizabeth Tavers and William Burke III, face up to 20 years in prison on some charges, including racketeering and mail fraud. Prosecutors say the three turned the probation department into their own criminal enterprise by trading jobs to family members and friends of legislators in exchange for regular budget increases, helping to build their political power. This is what every single court does since the 1789 Judiciary Act. So picking fall guys, are we? This is interesting. Commissioners. Uh, from news, uh, WITF.org, former PA Senator Ralph, Raphael Musto dies at 85. A former state senator from northeastern Pennsylvania has died after a long illness, leaving pending corruption charges against him unresolved. Raphael Musto died at his home in Pittston, surrounded by his family, according to his niece. He was 85. He had recently been released from a federal medical prison in North Carolina where he was sent in January after being declared mentally unfit to stand trial. Musto was charged with accepting cash and other parts for helping obtain taxpayer money for development projects. He had pleaded not guilty. That's day-to-day -day business too. So, everybody listen up. It's a crime to do that now, in case you haven't realized. Policies no longer conducive to the practice of law, or what is known as polycratis or politics. Interesting days. Yep. Yeah, uh, and now, what you see out there with the police state news is the cops are just shaking down the citizens like never before, and. What you got to realize, you got to get past it being the cops. Yeah, we know the cops are doing it. But who's writing their policies? And it's corporate council attorneys and attorneys. Okay. Um, getting to some more things going on with the police. Hopefully, we've got time. We've got, Absolutely. Uh, Let's see. A federal grand jury indicts former principal on sex charges. There's a. Department of Education surety. Okay, you work for that. You work for that uh, federal state. No, especially as a principal agent. Yeah, as a principal agent. There you go. 
just sick. But they're being held accountable now too, so it's nice to see. Uh so John Harold McGill, 56, has been charged after he allegedly attempted to arrange a sexual encounter with a 13-year-old via the internet and text message. The report indicates that McGill left his own children's home and he left them alone to drive to Lithonia thinking he would be meeting with the young girl. Instead, he was arrested by authorities as part of of an operation called Operation Broken Heart. One page single count indictment dated May 6th is pretty straightforward. So. It's just sick. Sick, sick. There so you go. We need to, you know, we gotta out weed them out of society. Yeah. And in, instead, the federal state has always put them in a position to do these sort of things. And uh, right it's all under school. that premise uh, that you talked about in the past called pedagogy. Right, education, and, and that's what it comes down to. I mean, you're if you're educated by the predator, it's going to teach you to be a very docile prey. I mean, if lions could do that, they, they would never have to move, right? They could just be like legislators and judges and attorneys never having to lift a hand to hunt anybody because they can teach them how to be good prey, and that's what's happened all this time up until now. Now, with the public law, everybody's going to be held accountable for their works and actions. Now, there's, of course, like I said, there's tons of police news. And you can see some of the stuff over at policemisconduct.net. Now, realize, of course, that's put up there by attorneys. The Cato Institute is a bunch of attorneys pointing the fingers at the cops. Okay? But uh, who let them down that road with their policies? Right. Uh, we got, uh, let's see, cops continuously raid man's home looking for him. The suspect died in 2006. Fox News, uh, you know, a story that just won't stay dead. NYPD won't stop raiding the former home of James Jordan Sr., although Jordan died eight years ago. The cops still want to talk to him. That was sick. That's just terrible terrorism of a widow. And Jesus spoke about that as well extensively in his walk. And he said, you know, it's just sick what you guys are doing. Moses doesn't protect any females. Um, the disciples had come and, and asked him, well, Moses has power, right? And this is around the time when they're asking him about, you know, paying homage to Caesar. And he says, show me a penny, you know. Then um, they come to him and he says, well, what about the female if her husband dies? Isn't she going to be passed around to keep her safe from state predation? And Jesus said, no. And the resurrection, he says, quote, you know not the scriptures of God. Because in the resurrection, they don't have to marry anybody. They're not preyed on by the state. And this type of thing no longer occurs. Now this officer, these officers that were terrorizing this widow was directed by corporate counsel. The yeah, same. right. The story is placing the blame on the police, you know, saying they're not very bright. But uh, they kept getting I, the I think call. The, the, the yeah, the cops are uh, <laughs> they they know better. That well, we we've been there like uh, you know uh, four times this year. I hear supposedly already. Right, but and 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 they keep going there. That's not because they want to go there. Somebody's telling them. Right, they're directed and, and they have the order to go out there. So everybody needs to roll over on the judges, then the prosecuting attorney and corporate counsel in that area for terrorizing widows. Mainly corporate counsel. Yep, not just terrorizing widows. I mean, she's a she's a widow. She's a mother. She's she's being terrorized by corporate corporate counsel prosecuting attorney and judges that are banking on human trafficking and putting her in states of fear you know and, and it, it, it's not fun when they killed my husband back in 2000 I mean they put us through hell they're they're constantly preying on widows and that's that's their function prior to now <clears throat> from allafrica.com this one was beautiful in Zimbabwe lawyer charged a new onslaught on rights defenders prominent lawyer trust Manda was on Thursday arrested and charged with defeating the course of justice in what appears to be a new campaign against rights defenders. Police alleged that Monda scuttled their investigations when he represented six ex 
and Bada diamond mining firm workers who were suing the police for implicating them in a $3 million diamond theft case. In a lawsuit filed at the high court last month, the axe workers said the po police forced them to confess to selling diamonds to Matar businessman Madasar Khan. They also disowned certain statements given to the police. Now, these attorneys have been terrorizing law enforcement up until now. And law enforcement is standing their ground. They're saying, no, this is not going to work. This is no longer policy. We're not going to be doing these things. And they're arresting the attorneys for these things. And they're arresting their um, agents uh, for doing what has normally been day-to-day -day business. Now, yeah, in Zimbabwe, uh, they've got a lot of history here and a lot of reasons to be angry at these attorneys. I mean, the IMF controls all... Uh, inflation rates uh, globally. Right, they're starving uh, people. And, and you know, look what they did to you know Zimbabwe's uh, currency a while back. Right, and flush it right down the toilet. And it's beautiful to see law enforcement are standing up now to these attorneys, and the agents and the businesses. And this is very pretty to see, and I hope that it continues and it goes faster and faster and faster. Now I know I'm leaving the farm the other night. We did this, and um, but on the public law. I would love to do this story as well. It's a very short Oh, one. the Broward County prosecutor arrested on meth? Yeah, that was my favorite thing. That's Florida and in Broward County, a bunch of stuff has been going down in Broward. So. Absolutely. And I'll let you read it because my throat, I'm going to get a drink of water real quick. Okay, Broward County Assistant State Attorney Molina Monpoint is facing a methamphetamine charge after she was pulled over for a traffic stop Monday. According to Wilton Manor's police, Momport was pulled over initially for driving with an expired tag. Uh, that was from, she had a tag from, uh, well, it says here, uh, the decal that goes on it. Failure to use the turn signal and having a tag that was not registered to the vehicle. The car's tag decal expired on July 2012. The arrest report stated that an officer asked mom point if there's anything illegal inside the car and at which point she said she did not know however there had previously been some attorney friends in her car that had smoked weed and had molly <laughs> talk about political cannibalism hey you know what it took if, her five seconds there didn't yeah, it yeah if you find anything illegal it's all because i had attorneys in the car just a little bit ago <laughs> i wouldn't yeah <laughs> Yeah, I might not want to mention the fact that they're your friends, but uh, I love it. Um, how much? How much of a friend can uh, anybody be with an attorney, and especially other attorneys, because they're, uh, you know, <laughs> they're in competition with one another, basically, uh, a lot of times. You see, Wilton Manor's police say they had found one clear capsule that contained a powdery substance that tested positive for meth and weighed roughly 0.1 grams. Mom Point was interviewed by police after being uh, read her rights. She be, uh, she again said her attorney friends left the molly in her car. Mom Point has been suspended without pay, according to Ron Ishoy, spokesman for the Broward State Attorney's Office. We have asked the governor's office to assign the case to the state attorney's office in another circuit, he added. Mom Poy had been working in the office uh, since, uh, let's see here, pull down, uh, since uh, January 2nd, 2013. Her annual salary is 41400 NBC6 attempted to speak to Mom Point at her home Wednesday evening, but she didn't respond. It's unknown if Mom Point has a lawyer handling the case. Well, I'm pretty sure it's not one of the ones that were in her car. She's prior. not going to find many <laughs> friends to help her, is she? <laughs> Interesting days. Cannibalism. That is so funny. I mean, it's just uh, it's profound on, on the level of love and care they have for each other. Um, I'm not exactly sure, and Bo wasn't sure what Molly is for all of the listeners. Well, it I think that's just be, a reference to the methamphetamine. Yeah, it must be something related to that. Um, really, it doesn't have anything to do. Prob that's probably the slang street term for it because they have quotations around it. Yeah, something, a slang term. Now, did you hear about the one that grand jury charges 
uh, former Blackwater guard with murder over killing Iraq civilians. No. This was kind of good to see. Uh, the grand jury has charged former Blackwater worldwide security guard with murder for his alleged role in a 2007 shooting of unarmed civilians in Baghdad. According to an indictment made public on Friday, a federal appeals court last month effectively ended a manslaughter case against the guard, Nicholas Slayton, but prosecutors had signaled they might uh, seek a new indictment against him. So, uh, Interesting. That wasn't happening before. Um, you know, Blackwater Guards, Halliburton, they were never being charged for all of their uh, Confederacy actions over in other countries, quote other countries, and now you know, it looks like these agents and, and employers, employees, are being held accountable, which is just beautiful. That's something that we've been waiting for, and, and it's a long time coming. A long time coming. Yeah, Fed Chair Janet Yellen admits America is an oligarchy. Very I didn't see story. that. One. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I don't like all this verbiage about you know constitutional republic in here, but uh, anyways, when avowed socialist Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders recently put Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen on the spot at Capitol Hill in a hearing regarding the state of America as an oligarchy, Yellen basically admitted that's what it's become. In the U.S. today, the top 1% own about 38% of the financial wealth of America. The bottom 60% own 2.3%. The senator began running down a harrowing description of the wealth gap, which has helped to shift all the power into the hands of the elite. Uh, we are still a capitalist democracy. No, this, this, this asks the questions. Uh, are we still a capitalist democracy? Well, yeah. well heck yeah, we are. Yeah. Because capitalism is cap it. It's a head count. And this is the Federal Reserve saying, you know, oh, it's somebody else, isn't it? And saying, look the other way. How funny. If you read the Federal Reserve directives, you'll find all of policy written in their directives. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah, basically, uh, you know, they admitted that the political power rests with the billionaire class. Yeah, which is the Federal Reserve Boards, the Corporate Council Attorneys, Association of Corporate Council. It's all just so sick. And But, as we've said and, and we maintain, they're being held accountable and it's just getting worse and worse for these attorneys, including after death. Now... I have a concern. On jsonline.com, <clears throat> there's a story with the headline, Did Lawyer Suicide Cost Him Final Pay? Court to Decide. Now, to all attorneys out there and law enforcement, now, we want to see attorneys held accountable. We want to also see them alive. However, determined as civilly dead, as is written in the court case. Now, this article, this, these attorneys in this court are trying to posture the murder of attorneys in order to compensate the murderers, which is usually their bosses. And, and I'll read the story so that everybody else knows what's going on. Law firm argues his death is breach of contract. A $250,000 check found on the seat of Ira Bordeaux's vintage Lexus Coupe shortly after his suicide has sparked an unusual legal fight over whether the attorney's suicide amounted, amounted to a breach of contract that has prevented his estate from receiving more than $41,000 in fees. The check, discovered by David Bordeaux shortly after the 54-year-old brother's death, was from West Bend Mutual Insurance and was written to Ira Burdell and Stiles and Pompeian. The money was a settlement Burdell negotiated on behalf of the survivors of a New Berlin co couple killed by a drunken driver in 2012. Burdell was to share the one-third contingency fee with the Stiles firm court records show. 
but the Stiles firm has balked at paying the Bordeaux estate his $41,666 cut, arguing Bordeaux's suicide in July 2013 and his River Hills home negated the contract. This opens the door to law firms murdering attorneys and, and saying that's a breach of contract, we don't have to pay anything and keeping their assets, which is sick. That That is an incentive to murder attorneys and we don't want to see attorneys uh, killed other than within the action of civil death and, and I want all of our law enforcement aware of what's going on and how dirty and malicious these bankers are when it comes right down to it. They don't care about each other either as we're seeing with the political capitalism. Yeah, because what they're doing is they're devising a way to keep the wealth among the attorneys instead of have it, having it to uh, being redistributed back to humanity. Right, and and with this incentive, with this argument of those fees, it makes it look like perhaps he did not commit suicide. If they're claiming that his death is a breach of contract, that's all they had to do is kill him. So you might want to look around and see what's going on here because, you know, that is not indicative of a suicide. Especially, you know, he's got everything going for him. He's got a $250,000 check in his car. What could be the purpose? And in the stories that I'm reading about him, there was no reason for his suicide. He was at the top of his game, just like most attorneys that are being deemed uh, accidental deaths, natural deaths. One of them, not even a month ago, he was 30 years old or so. They said he just died in his home, sitting in his chair. You know. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along. And th these are sick, sick, sick things. And we don't want to see um, anybody die other than civil death because this is called accountability. That We don't want anybody just scooting off and, and not being held accountable for what they've done. And, of course, we and don't want to see not being murder. able to roll on others. Right. And we don't absolutely don't want to see them killing each other because that's just that's wrong. You know, killing is killing. And... I would prefer to see them in North Korea. Well, let's get all the dirt on uh, everybody else, uh, you know, first. Uh, right. You know, because there's two million attorneys and what's known commonly as the continental United States landmass anyways. Uh, let's see, and some other startling statistics you got to think about. We uh, see there's about 2% of the world's population in that same area, you know, known as uh, United States of America, uh, which doesn't exist as a country, by the way, folks. Uh, the United States of America is a style as uh, it is uh, stated quite clearly in the Articles of Confederation written in 1777. Agreed upon 1781, Article 1, the style of this confederacy uh, shall be the United States of America. So, the United States of America is a style, but anyways, moving past that, uh, in that uh, area, there is 2% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated so this is absolutely a uh, prison society okay they're 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 making all kinds of, of money off of sending people to jail primarily for commercial crimes under 27 CFR 72.11 where it says all crimes are commercial uh, there are people spending life sentences, one of them uh, for selling uh, LSD, two consecutive life sentences, so there's no possibility of parole, for a uh, selling a chemical, okay? But yet these pharmaceutical companies, they sell this, this stuff that's killing us, and um, of course it's legal for them. All right, so, all right, moving past that, uh, New York City Councilman heard on ex-Senator's wire is arrested. All right, this is good. This is a uh, councilman. 
New York City uh, councilman who was unknowingly recorded by a former state senator cooperating with prosecutors was indicted in Queens this morning. And this was on May 7th, so this is the other day. And this is Councilman Reuben Wills, Democrat in Queens, was arrested at his home and charged with a 12 fraud related crime, including falsifying business records and scheming to defraud. A quick refresher Will was one of the uh, nine people secretly recorded by former Senator Shirley Huntley. A uh, Democrat from Queens who has uh, since been sentenced to a year and one day in prison in a separate corruption scheme. Huntley, who hadn't yet been sentenced at the time of the recording, was looking for a more lenient sentence. Wills was released without bail. Uh, is Huntley's former chief of staff. Huntley, however, recorded wills for federal prosecutors, so she turned state's evidence. Uh, the charges against him Wednesday came from the state attorney general, Eric Schneiderman. Okay, again, this is another political, political cannibalism story. And this, is, uh, this is big stuff here, basically. Uh, the more the Associated Press... Uh, let's see here... You know, uh, I'm telling you, in my district, I'm innocent, Wills told reporters outside court. This is America, people. You're presumed innocent until you're proved guilty. Yeah, that's how it's always been, right? <laughs> yeah. Chief All those plebeians. Oh, yeah, we are. Yeah. Uh, Board of Directors there. Chief of Staff. Aw. It's sad to be you. Yeah, it's it, the reality of it has always been... That uh, you're guilty until proven rich. Right. Wills added that he is not resigning from the council. Kind of sounds like Rob Ford there. I'm not stepping down. I got a job to do here. Yeah. Much of the indictment centers on missing state funds given to New York for Life, a nonprofit Wills founded in 2009. Yep, that's a way to funnel money outside of. The original ways to funnel money through the IRS, through the IELTA Trust, through all of these different schematics, developments, development funds, commission states. You know, there's a lot of doors opening and possibilities opening up for that new surety. The nicer it sounds, usually the worse the government program is. Right. Absolutely. It's like you can be assured if it's the. Um, Save the Soft Lovable Kitties Foundation. They're probably uh, trafficking children or something. Absolutely. And that's the action of hearts and minds. It's a war tactic. Uh, let's see here. So let's see. He's charged with falsifying several documents involving the nonprofit, including $11,500 check used an unpaid invoice to fake other donations. According to the complaint, Wills has been under investigation by State Attorney General Eric Schmiderman's office in connection with tens of thousands of state money that went missing, including $33,000, uh, a state grant that went to the nonprofit. Wills is accused of stealing more than 3000 from the New York State Office of Children and Family Services using a dummy organization called Micro Targeting. To move money, some of uh, scroll down, which he used to buy a uh, $750 Louis Vuitton bag. Louis Vuitton. I, I don't even know what that is. Louis, Louis, Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton. Oh, yeah. He's naked in the garden. He's got to use that entitlement. And, and I'll tell you something that little program that he had outside of the Department of Health and Human Services is only one part of the schematic. The Department of Health and Human Services alone is a banking schematic. Of course, that was the establishment of the Office of Population Affairs that Henry Kissinger uh, brought into play in 1975, which is called the Department of Health and Human Services, and it's just a business model. It's a schematic, and there's a lot more coming from the direction of these charges against him as everything starts going down because not only did Huntley roll on him, 
Now he's got to roll on somebody else, and it just goes on and on and on. Unless they take out his feet like they did uh, Rob Ford recently by presenting him as a nutball, a raving lunatic. You know, like, all is fair in love and war. Let's see here, and then just finishing up, uh, Jelani Mills, a campaign worker who ran the dummy organization, was charged on four counts. Mills was being held on a $20,000 bail and wasn't available to comment. Schneiderman said that Will's actions constitute a stunning violation of the faith that he asked voters to place him in. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's just so out of character for the other actors in Congress doing the same thing. And so out of character for the other board of directors and so out of character for corporate counsel attorneys to do stuff like this like human trafficking and embezzlement and stuff you know how it is when somebody's trying to save face by picking a fall guy sick sick yeah sick. speaking of uh, fall guys again um, back to the cops who are fall guys for attorneys um, they almost blinded this man with a taser to the eye Ugh. during a routine traffic stop Absolutely. It's in Ohio. Horrifying. Yeah, Fayette County. Uh, man, uh, I read this one earlier here, but uh, let me just, just bring it up here if I can get past these advertisements. Boy, that's the next thing I'm going after all these people for their uh, <coughs> adverts. Constantly changing my heading, taking up the uh, bandwidth. Yaddy, yaddy, yaddy. That's a crime right there. Cops almost blind man. Taser to the eye during the routine traffic stop. Um, so, an Ohio man is fighting a lawsuit against police in Fayette County following the incident and almost left him blinded as the cops tasered him directly in the eye during a routine traffic stop. Matthew David Kelly claims that a sheriff's deputy and an Ohio State Highway Patrol trooper used excessive force in deploying a taser and stunning Kelly twice, causing him to lose vision in his right eye. Sick. Kelly was a passenger in the truck, stopped by the cops. He was asleep at the time when the driver was pulled over and arrested for being under the influence of alcohol. Okay, so this guy's just asleep in the truck, you know, he's, you know... Passing. How'd you like to get woken up with a taser in your eye? That's the new, uh, I guess that's the new alarm clock method that the corporal counsel attorneys are asking the cops to use. Uh, the video taken from the police dash cam shows Kelly struggling inside the truck and getting caught up in the seat belt as the highway patrol trooper attempts to wake him up. The sheriff's deputy then rushes to the passenger side of the vehicle with the taser drawn. After failing to put Kelly completely, after failing to pull him completely from the vehicle and leaving him still tangled in the seatbelt halfway out of the truck, the deputy fired a taser which struck Kelly directly in the eye. Oh. Deputy is heard yelling, Get on the ground, get on the ground, now on the ground. I'll do it again. Get on the ground. Oh. With his hands on his head, clearly disoriented. He just, he just woke up out of a slumber, got tasered in the eye. Yeah, uh, so Kelly, you know, then he received another jolt from the taser directly into his eye. Horrifying. Cops then managed to free Kelly from the seatbelt. Uh, the video shows Kelly telling cops, "My eye hurts." And I bet it Man. does as it becomes swollen shut. Paramedics who later tended to Kelly said he suffered near total loss of vision. Mm -hmm. When asked for comments on the incident by local news station 10 TV, Fayette County Sheriff Vernon Stanford said Deputy Signs was not reprimanded for those allegations. I thoroughly reviewed the video and believe he acted within policy. Yeah, he did act within policy. Yes. The policy you attorneys write for these cops to carry out. Absolutely. Don't hold the cop accountable. He acted within policy according to the directives. You hold the corporate counsel attorneys accountable for these things. Yeah, well still, these cops that are going along with this policy, uh, why, you know, why don't you either find a job or find a way to fight back against the attorneys that 
are nothing but a thorn in the side of humanity. They're right. the only predators that we have on this planet. Right. A plague. The plague. 10TV notes that the deputy has a history of reprimands for unprofessional conduct and failure to perform his duties. Yeah, so they're vilifying him, of course, in the media, when in reality, he's just following policy, and perhaps before, he, he was trying to step away and walk out of it and was threatened, you know, and that's that's a lot of their their review techniques and their... their um, all of these testing measures and stuff. Texas town shaken, of course, by that uh, officer shooting that 93-year-old woman. Yeah, that was That was a tragic one. Absolutely horrifying. Uh, ABCnews.go.com, Mexican official charged with organized crime, finally. Mexican federal prosecutor said they have charged the former interior secretary, which is equivalent to John Kerry, in Michoacan State with participating in organized crime. Federal Prosecutor Rodrigo Archundia said Wednesday there is evidence that Jose Jesus Reina met several times with leaders of the Nice Templar drug cartel. Reina was detained last month during the investigation. Federal prosecutors say Reina met with members of the Knights Templar, including the fugitive cartel leader Servando Gomez. A video showed Reina and Gomez was released on the was released on the internet by an anonymous person shortly after the former official was detained. Now this is just day-to-day -day business prior to this. Now the drug cartels are of course maintained and run by local businesses in every county. This is global. Every county, every territory, the drug cartel is run through the businesses and the reason that human beings are charged with uh, commercial crimes under 27 CFR 72.11 says it clearly in the definition. Those are crimes against the laws of revenue. So if you're a drug dealer, you're undercutting the local county's criminal enterprise. If you're uh, selling pot, you're undercutting the federal state. Read these things. It's all written. It's all out in the open for everybody to see. But it is nice to see these corporations being held accountable now. Now from <clears throat> DaijiWorld.com Indian American official charged with fraud in the United States Incorporated. New York, May 8th. An Indian American executive at an investment advisory firm in New York has been charged with fraud by the U.S. regulator for, dis uh, for distributing falsified performance results and siphoning investor proceeds for his luxury car payments. The Securities and Exchange Commission alleged that Afelion Fund Management's chief investment officer, Vineet, Kalucha fraudulently altered an outside audit firm's report reviewing the performance and investment account he managed. SEC has also announced an asset freeze against the firm and charged Afelion's chief financial officer, George Palathinkel, for his complicity in the alleged fraud. Palathinkel allegedly learned about Kalucha's falsification, which essentially changed an investment loss into a major investment gain in the account, it said. Nevertheless, the falsified report shows the phony gain, instead of the actual loss, was distributed to prospective investors. That's the game of risk management. They do this on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why in these pooling and servicing accounts, you see one guy has bad credit, one guy has really, really great credit, another guy has okay credit, and they do this all the time in pool and services accounts according to the Devonshire Participation Program, which of course, again, they are being held accountable for at this time. This never happened before in history that we know of. They were never held accountable. It just kept flipping from Rome to Germany to Austria to Cambodia to United States Incorporated to India and back and forth, back and forth, dependent on market conditions. And now there's a, a stopgap in place, which is just, this is amazing. Uh, and again, you know, for everybody that's not, or that's a new listener, you can visit chooseyourside.org and tammypepperman.org 
and read about the case. Read about what happened last year to make all of these things possible to lift that weight off of humanity. And um, it's just profound. Absolutely profound. Now, the Pope Francis is urging governments to redistribute wealth to the poor. Maybe even half of it, he says in a headline here. Yeah. This is another part of the presentation. They were they had like this actor up there going on a hunger strike and all that yesterday saying, oh, we want the Pope to help us and stop all this genocide. Well, the Pope's function has always been that presentation in Matthew 27. So everybody delivers up Jesus and the chief priest and and uh, uh, chief priests and elders come in and, and they say no we want we want our blood we want this we want this you give me Jesus and everybody's always delivered up Jesus and of course the priests were the one hiding those things under charitable appearances and in Matthew 27 it, it maintains this two times the first time is when Judas hands back the bag of silver and the chief priests say, well, we can't put that back in the treasury. Well, of course not. The treasury has gold in it. And Federal Reserve notes, of course, are not gold. They're, they're a, a counterfeit currency. And um, so they decided, well, since we can't put the friends back in the treasury, we're going to build pauper cemeteries, other things for you to worship, other things for you to look at and think that we're charitable. And this is exactly what's going on again, of course, uh, as Governor Pilate there was crucifying you, Jesus, um, he was washing his hands constantly in holy water, telling the priest, you forgive me, right? You forgive my sins. And that and that's just been a perpetual business schematic up until this point in time. And it's, it's really nice to see um, not just the accountability, but also the Pope is up there. He's advertising for that they're the good guys. Obama's up there advertising that he's a good guy. You've got all of these politicians. Cracking jokes, getting you to like him again, just like an attorney. Right, and they're all advertising for that schematic, and, and they wouldn't have to advertise. Obama if, is an attorney, by the way, for you, those uh, out there that don't know. Right. He turned in his bar card when he uh, took the office. That doesn't uh, mean he expatriated to the bar in any shape or form. Right, and, that, and that's what's been going on all of this time. When somebody takes an oath to be a citizen of somewhere, they're taking an oath to a lord. You can go back through history and find these oaths and, and everything else. And, and um, once you've taken that oath, you have to rescind it in some way. You have to take another oath somewhere else. And this is also written in the 1929 Geneva Convention, 1864 Geneva Convention. Um, specifically the 1929 Geneva Convention because everybody's prisoner of war because in 1933 the United States Incorporated went bankrupt. There's no government there. It's just an illusion of a government. And when you're patronizing that as a citizen, say you have a license to drive, license to do businesses, this or that, you're patronizing that thing. You're calling it your father. It's your Lord God. And if you don't walk away from that, if you don't put something down saying, no, I'm expatriated, and you repatriate somewhere else that's not part of that corporation, you're still patronizing that. You're still a citizen of it. And that is all inclusive with of anybody who's taken a note to the bar. And of course, Lincoln is the one who opened the door on that one. Three days before the 14th Amendment was passed, there was also the Expatriation Act. That thing allowed the attorney to expatriate as citizens of the United States Incorporated and hurriedly patriate to the Bar Association, which of course is a fictional government. And we took care of that list last year uh, with the uh, various orders uh, maintaining. Look, they tried to escape. And according to the 1929 Geneva Convention, anybody who tries to escape as a prisoner of war under the 1929 Geneva Convention, they are allowed to be prisoners in a prison. That is the only time that any being can be put into a state of institutionalization, according to the 1929 Geneva Convention. Well, in 1933, the attorneys came in after the United States Incorporated uh, declared its bankruptcy and hurriedly took that oath under 12 U.S.C. subsection 73, verifying and stipulating that they were not hypothecated. 
That in itself, that oath, is evidence that the attorney has been escaping since the 1933 Emergency Banking Act. And now we're seeing this fall, Rome is falling, everybody's being held accountable for their works and actions, and especially that attorney, which, I mean, that was... This news, we've done uh, three shows this week. This is the third show, and we still, we've got uh, 14 minutes left, and we're not going to get done with all of the things that we had scheduled to do. I mean, it's just back to back to back to back. Daily, we're getting <clears throat> so much new information on these attorneys charged, on these legislators charged with criminal activity, and it just keeps growing and growing, and, and, um, this is just amazing, absolutely amazing to be in this point in time where I can witness these things actually occurring after all these years of working hard to hold them accountable. Um, this came out um, yesterday. Uh, the story is at counterpunch.org. Call it the cops at your own peril. Now, this shed some light on, a little more light on... Uh, the story as I've seen it elsewhere. Uh, let's see. Live free or die as a model of the state of New Hampshire. I hope the residents are prepared to die because living free is not what they do. New Hampshire is merely a cog within the American Stasi state. But I am referring to what goes on with, within New Hampshire itself. Not the police state existence imposed by Washington. Uh, on May 5th, Attorney William Baer was arrested at a school board meeting at which he went over a two-minute speaking rule while trying to get some explanation from the Guilford, New Hampshire school board for assigning sexually explicit reading material to his 14-year-old daughter's English class. So this guy was an attorney. I didn't, I didn't know that before. I didn't say that in the other story. The evasiveness of the school board angered Mr. Baer, and he spoke out again in support of another parents protest and was promptly arrested by a goon thug cop so uh, I guess you know I'm an attorney I can do whatever I want you know that mentality is 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 you know going away now uh, thanks to the agreed entry but uh, so I, I guess there's some different levels here you know I mean on, on one level okay yeah what are they doing uh, ramming this stuff down uh, the kids throats here is sexually explicit reading material as, as an assignment right you know so on the other hand why aren't you just taking your kids out of school because right. they're all you know the school is nothing but a tool of the state uh, school board chairman Sue Allen who's no legislative power nevertheless managed to create a law backed by police violence after all if Bush and Obama can create laws by edict why not a school board chairman under Allen's edict, if a parent violates the two-minute rule that Allen imposed, she has the parent arrested. Well, I mean, the, it, it, there you go. It tells right. you right there. Yeah. You know, the, the, the school is a gulag. Absolutely, uh, and it goes into depth on <clears throat> the, the depth of depravity that's being propagated by Congress, by these actors. And this attorney is, he looks like he's advertising for petitions and things like that. Oh, sure. Yeah, and, and I think that's probably the premise of the story. But right. you had um, called attention to a story uh, recently with Obama up there during that uh, White House, uh, what did they call it, uh, the White House meeting, press conference, or, you know, it looked like the actor studio, the HBO presentation and stuff like that. Where Obama was up there, and he provided a picture, and it's up on Huffington Post, of him uh, sitting in the, um, what do you call that chair, the, the iron chair? Yeah, the iron throne from uh, the uh, TV series Game of Thrones. Oh, it's just absolutely And, and he's, got a, yeah, he's got a crossbow on his desk. And supposedly the administration itself tweeted that. Right, and, and it says that on... Um, the Huffington Post today because so often you know we were looking around and at first it looked like a fallacy you know and a hit piece but in all actuality 
this thing was actually listed on the Huffington Post and they had a screencast or a screenshot of the actual tweet and um, these things are disgusting folks this president this attorney in chief is laughing about being the same as this King Joffrey now I've seen several of the Game of Thrones and this king um, I think the worst one so far was uh, season 2 episode 4 where he had been given prostitutes by his uncle and uh, they were in his room and, and they were going to perform whatever actions necessary as prostitutes for the king and he had had one of the prostitutes beat the other um, into absolute um, a disaster state. Well, he, later he just kills one with a crossbow. Right, and and the same thing. He kills people, hangs their head on stakes. Um, this is not a joke, folks. You are patronizing and calling this monster who assimilates with this King Joffrey your president, your government. Yeah, and he's got uh, dominion over the... Uh, the seven kingdoms, if you will, because under that Atlantic Charter, it doesn't matter what country the attorneys are telling you you're from, you're all there to be a behest of the United States Congress to offset the congressional bankruptcy. And it's the same concept. Congress got global governance, global governance over seven continents in 1941 with the Atlantic Charter. This is not funny yeah so okay, we've had have, King Jeffrey since uh, 1941 essentially right, right and this Obama I don't care what color he is what religion what he states he is what titles he's got he is proud and displaying that he is associated with and akin to this King Joffrey if that does not tell you what you're facing if you continue to patronize that thing, I don't know what does, and I don't know how to reach you. These things are horrifyingly, horrifyingly bad. And you can see this at Huffington Post, which is mainstream media. It's run and maintained by the Broadcasting Board of Governors, and they're giving you notice. This is public notice that you have a King Obama up there that enjoys such practices if he's uh, maintaining this and of course it's photoshopped of course those things but it came out of the White House the screenshot actually maintains the tweet that was that was tweeted um, the original tweet came out of the White House at White House and the West Rose Wing um, hashtag WHCD 9:34 p.m. the 3rd of May 2014. There have been 8,357 retweets, 5,813 favorites, and in this screenshot, it has Obama sitting in that um, iron throne or whatever you call it, uh, and around him are his chiefs of staff, and this is absolutely horrifying if you continue to patronize that thing after he's shown you what he likes what he enjoys and um, you know this is white right out of the White House and uh, you know wake up now I got four minutes sick. here I'd really like to get to this story on uh, show you uh, the level that uh, you know the uh, police department's mentality is at here from the story out of CBS Miami uh, on December 10th, now it goes back to December 10th, we're finally just getting this, but more than two dozen officers from across Miami-Dade County converged on a blue Volvo that had crashed in the backyard of Townhouse, a townhouse on 65th Street just off of 27th Avenue. As the car was wedged helplessly between a light pole and a tree, nearly a minute passed before officers opened up firing approximately 50 bullets at the car and the two unarmed men inside the vehicle. Now earlier 
this guy, the one, you know, the, the driver had been uh, caught on film in an armed robbery. Okay, and that's what they were after him for. And then, um, let's see, well, let me just go on. The two men inside the car survived that initial volley of gunfire, according to witnesses, who said they could see the men moving inside the Volvo. Everything went quiet for nearly two minutes before the officers opened up a second time, unleashing an unrelenting torrent of bullets that lasted almost 25 seconds. By the time it was over, the two men inside the car were dead. Uh, let's see, news... Uh, CBS had learned that a total of 23 officers fired a total of at least 377 rounds. Bulls were sprayed everywhere. They hit the Volvo, other cars in the lot, fence posts, and neighbor, neighboring businesses. They blasted holes in a townhouse where a 12-year-old dove to the ground for cover and a four-month-old slept in his crib. It was like the Wild Wild West. Man, crazy, said Anthony Vandiver, who barely made it through the back door of his home before the gunfire erupted. Shooting just wild, shooting all over the place. Bullets could have come through the window. Anything could have happened. They were thinking, uh, they weren't thinking. They weren't thinking at all. Earlier that night, the driver of the Volvo, Adrian Montesano, robbed a Walgreens at gunpoint and then later shot a Miami-Dade police officer, Saul Rodriguez, in a nearby trailer park. My Montesano escaped the officer's patrol car, eventually dumping at his grandmother's house in Hialeah before fleeing into the blue Volvo. By 5 a.m., every cop in South Florida was looking for that blue Volvo, intent on catching the man who'd shot one of their own. But what police didn't realize before they started shooting, and I don't know how you would not realize that, uh, there was a second man in the car, Cursini... Cursini Valdez, Valdez, who had committed no crime. So they've got an innocent man in there. They shot to death. And in fact, CBS News was the first to report both men inside the Volvo were unarmed at the time police caught up with them. Um, Montesano and Valdez were killed by dozens of rounds that tore through their bodies. Montesano and Valdez weren't the only ones struck. Two Miami-Dade police officers were hit as well, caught in the crossfire. One officer was shot in the arm, the second was hit in the arm and grazed in the head. If the bullet had stuck just a half inch to the side, the officer would have been killed. The uh, sound of gunfire was deafening, literally deafening. Two Miami police officers sustained uh, ruptured eardrums from the cac cacophony of uh, shots. Let's see, uh, I spent the last five months here piecing this together according to the uh, the, the story, but um, the point of the matter is, is this is evidence that police are not protecting humanity. No, Walgreens. They're protecting what right? Uh, and ultimately, those those two men, one of them, an innocent victim bystander, were not armed when they were gunned down by law enforcement. And these types of things, you know, we've seen this in the past when. Uh, Al Capone got ruled on. He was working for Anheuser Busch, which is one of the leading members of the uh, Association of Corporate Counsel, things like that. And um, these things are just sick, sick. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. As the smoke cleared and the sun begins to rise, officers drag Montesano and Vlade's body from the car. Although he appears dead, they decide to transport transport Vlade's to Jackson. Slowly, neighbors came out of their homes. The policemen that had on the black and white vests were out there laughing like it was so funny Sick. said one of the neighbors because they got a free shot off of them people shooting all them bullets like that that don't make no sense sick well it's midnight everybody and it's time for us to go elsewhere be well thank you for joining us for the public live every friday night Right here with Bo and Tammy. Be well. All right, bye.
Scottish Sovereigns on land and the home of No Borders Radio. 